example if international women's day was a day like christmas where we gave presents actually i think we should wouldn't that be nice that would be lovely <laughs> celebration of women and how far we've come and all of that sort of thing but if it was a day in which we gave presents i would suggest this book is the best present to give someone that you love in your life to celebrate international women's day it's by kemi neckverpill who is truly an inspirational coach and uh leader i'm going to say but this book power actually uh in a it, I found it inspiring and challenging, one of the best books I've read recently. Absolutely loved it. I smashed through 110 pages in one day, and I don't generally do that. I generally put a book down and then come back to it, but I just was like, I need to stay up to read more. I yeah. was it really resonated with me yeah it's challenging and inspiring in all the good ways and um, I'm very thrilled that Kemi herself joins us now. Hi there, Kemi. Hi, pleased to be with you both. Hi, Joe. Hi, Seppel. Um, Kemi, you are su such an accomplished coach. You have trained with Dr. Brené Brown. You studied yoga in India. Your experience is extraordinary, and you you work with very accomplished women. But I get the sense that you meet women who struggle every day with a sense of self and with lack of confidence, despite how accomplished they are. So my question is. Is this just inherent to being female? Oh, a big question. Um, there are definitely aspects of being female that are woven through each of us, regardless of our external accolades or, you know, society's accomplishments and the things that kind of we can tick the box or society ticks the box for us. I'm very blessed to work with incredibly successful women in many areas. And when I say success, I don't just mean within their work. I mean, you know, they have families that are working or their sense of self. But within that, as women, we have to operate within a system every single day that in some ways tells us that we are not small enough, that we are too loud, that we are too aggressive. And then add to that as well the intersectionality of color for me or for women that have disabilities or people that are neurodivergent we constantly hear the message that we're not quite good enough yet. And I think, yes, it doesn't matter where we are um, on the spectrum, it affects us every day. Kimmy, you mentioned the, the system, and in, in the book you make a point that the we often lament that the system is broken, but you say that the system actually was never broken, the system was never right in the first instance, and that we need to rebuild the system. Yeah. But when you have people sitting in traditional power positions who don't want to let go, who, who how do you get buy-in from them? What's your experience been with that? It's, um, it's an interesting thing, actually, because sometimes I think we focus too much on the people that have traditional power and we forget this form of internal power that we have as individuals. But then also, as we see so often now, when women come together as a united force, we can demolish systems and structures that no longer serve us. And if we can't demolish them, we suddenly start to just slowly, slowly you know, just tap away until those systems have to take a good look at themselves. So your book, Power, is all about us finding, exploring, understanding, owning, stepping into our power, regardless mm. of whatever systems we may be working and living within. Mm. Um, and I know this is a massive question because there's an entire book that I can tell you spent a very long time working on lovingly to tell us how, but is it possible for you, for you very briefly to tell us if we want to step into our power, what are some of the processes we can go through? Well, the actual word power itself in the book, I've broken it down into five power principles. So P is for presence, O is for ownership, W is for wisdom, E is for equality, and R is for responsibility. I think that as women, when we tap into any one of those principles, if we can be responsible for our lives and how we feel and the boundaries that we put in place, if we can honor our equality around other people, regardless of who those other people are, if we can be present to our circumstances, what's working, what's not working, even when we fall out of our power, and I talk about that all the way through the book, this isn't about you will find your power one day and you will have power forever. Ever. that is not realistic and I think it sets women up or for us to feel that one day we will feel all powerful the idea is that we will find ourselves in our situation where we feel powerless and here are some tools that where we can step into and rebuild our power each time 
You just mentioned intersectionality just then, and I want to touch on something because we, we don't all start from the, the same baseline. So, we, you know, our race, our ethnicity, our religion, our ability, our gender identity, our class, these all make a difference in how powerful or powerless we've, we've felt at certain times. And in, in the context of the pandemic, something was thrown up um, that we often ignore in this country. We don't talk a lot about class in this country. We, we pretend that it doesn't exist. And in the context of uh, essential workers, that was thrust in our face. Mm-hmm. So I guess, I guess the question I want to ask is, if we're not all starting from the same baseline, how do we ensure that women are seen, heard and recognised with all of our differences? Mm, that's where a, a community of women, you know, the reality is, is that some of us don't start from the same position. And so for those of us that have a level of privilege, whatever that is, I know that I have a lot of privilege and yet I navigate the world as a black woman. So I don't have race privilege and I don't have gender privilege, but there are other privileges that I have. And with those privileges, I create spaces for and support women that don't have the privileges that I have. And I think that's what we can do. And I think that's the joy of, you know, International Women's Day is that we come together to support each other regardless of where we're starting or maybe because of where we're starting, because it is, a, you know, we're not a uniform, all women are women. We are very different. We have different experiences. We have different desires. But I think ultimately we want to be able to stand within ourselves and to be able to connect with each other in an authentic way that in itself is powerful. And Kemi, I think one of the other things that the pandemic really shone a light on was the burden on women, the mental burden, the mental load, the Mm -hmm. workload, both within and outside of the home. Mm -hmm. And so I sort of think, okay, yes, we can step into our power and you talk about power of agency, but if you can't walk away from your life or if you can't actually set a boundary that day, how are women to respond when you feel like actually I'm drowning? How can I feel any sense of power in this state right now? Personally, I think there's a power in owning I am drowning. And actually what a lot of women do is that we fall into this idea that we have to be good, that we have to look as if we have it together all the time, that we're the good wife, the good daughter, the good sister, the good friend, the good everything. So it's powerful to even say, I am drowning and I would say the next power move is then to share that with someone and then the next is to ask for the support that you need that is power I love the idea of it (laughs) (laughs) and I love the idea of the permission to say I'm drowning I don't think we do that for each other or for ourselves ever no and it's interesting because it comes back to this idea of community and i talk in the book about this that we have to be really mindful about the people that we have around us i know in my earlier days i would very much you know have this kind of veneer of being very strong and i was kind of invulnerable and you know you know just kind of like i can do it all and you know if you want a job done properly do it yourself because i was kind of raised that way and then i realized over time that actually it made me feel incredibly isolated and incredibly lonely and when i started to practice saying to people I'm not going well, like I'm struggling, I need help, that that actually created deeper and more powerful connections with the women that I surrounded myself with. And I can honestly say that now within my friendship groups and even as a female entrepreneur with other female entrepreneurs, that we can call each other in tears saying, Mm -hmm. I cannot believe this happened, but we can also call each other with great success and celebration about something that has worked within our life or within our work. So I think even in some ways we're breaking the status quo as women to say, I don't have it all together all the time. I need help and I need support. And I do want to add to that, Joe. just sort of what you said around within the home, that can be really hard. And it's true because one thing I also know is that sometimes as women, we will request, you know, support. We will request help and it doesn't come. And then we, we can then withdraw inwards and go, oh, well, that's it. And our resentment builds up and our anger But sometimes the answer we've got, the power move is actually doing something about the answer that we keep getting. And and women often give. They're not takers. So it's really... We're conditioned to, to, you know, you mentioned this in your book, Kimmy, we're conditioned mm. to serve others. Yes. So that, that idea mm-hmm. of asking for help comes, it doesn't come naturally, but helping comes naturally. Yeah, and interestingly, yes. I learned a few years ago, I had to reach out to my network <clears throat> with a continual request for childcare. 
and mm. I hated it, right? It was really mm. hard for me to do that. But I realised I wanted to be that for my friends and they weren't asking me and I wasn't asking yeah. them. And yeah. by just yeah. simply making myself vulnerable, that opened yeah. the door for them to do that to me. And I was like, oh, of course, we have to model it in each other. 100%. We can't, we, we really struggle to accept the help, but we all want to give the help. And then mm. what we create actually is mismatched relationships. You've got one person that feels indebted and burdened and one person that's not receiving anything. So over time, those relationships aren't necessarily sustainable and can't be powerful because of the structure in which they're set up. But it is, you know, it is a practice. Women standing in our power is a practice. Asking for help and support is powerful and it's a practice. Kimmy, we mentioned the pandemic a couple of times. One other thing the pandemic thrust upon us is it showed us the cracked race relations that we have in this country. And I want to talk about power and race because you were brought up in um, five different foster homes, uh, in white foster homes in in England. Um, You say in the book that you were scared to to share your lived experience and, and to talk about the themes of race and power. Can you tell us about how your upbringing shaped your relationship to power? Oh, I can tell you, I there was none. <laughs> you know, I definitely, and you know, this is what they say, isn't it, authors, that we write the books that we need for ourselves. So I was one of the tens of thousands of Nigerian children born to middle class parents in the 1960s and 70s, were fostered in England. So I was one of many, and I can, you know, hand on heart say that actually my outcome has been really good. It didn't turn out that way for everyone. It was very clear to me that I had no power. It was very clear to me that I did not get to ask for help or support, that I was to be quiet, that I was to be grateful, which I then learned in this kind of, you know, subtle racism. I I, I was told you're black, but you're a good one. So then I focus on being good. That I spent a lot of energy. And I know that women, regardless of race, spend a lot of time in wanting to be good. But for me as a good black girl, that was a lot of emotional labor. And I just knew that I was powerless. I just knew I had to be thankful and grateful for any situation that I found myself in and cross my fingers and hope for the best. And so what I've realized now as a 47 year old woman who has lived these power principles through my life, that it is possible to build power. And yet because of race, because of where I choose to live, I can still walk down the street and have a racist slant thrown at me. I don't pretend that doesn't happen to me, it does. But I also have a sense of internal power now that allows me either to share that with someone that I know can hold me if it makes me emotional. Sometimes it just completely destabilizes me. Sometimes it just rubs off my back. It doesn't matter at all. Um, But I have people around me that I can communicate my lived experience and it won't be gaslighted. It won't be denied and people won't try and put a, you know, positive spin on it. And I really love in the book, Kemi, that you address women of colour who might be reading the book and Mm -hmm. white women who might be reading the Mm -hmm. book, who obviously Mm -hmm. I am, and you Mm -hmm. challenge us to really investigate and understand and Mm -hmm. to take the time to hear more of those stories. And I, I, I loved that reminder. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Because I think, you know, I can only walk in my shoes, but, you know, I was raised by white family. So the first kind of my first kind of parental attachment was to my white mother. And, you know, I have been loved so much by white people. So in some ways, because of my upbringing, I can stand in both sides. I can kind of have the sort of black experience, well, you know, my personal experience, and and sort of step a little bit into some of the white experience. And I hope that in the book, because of that, I'm able to communicate to both sides. And I also share, you know, in the book, the power of identity, and where that can get really confused and muddled as well along the way. So we do have different identities, we do have different lived experiences, and when women can acknowledge that in each other, that in itself is another form of power. Kimmy, I love how throughout the book you're, you're peppering all of your personal experiences and there was this mo- one moment where I felt like you took me back to my own childhood. It was the playground where we meet oh. your bully, Darren Page, and his racist insults. Mm. But your mm. experience went further than mine because it was a pivotal moment for you. It was a moment where you discovered... Um, your first lesson in power. It was Mm. a lesson in control and command. Can you perhaps share that in a nutshell for us? 
Yeah, I'll try and share it without spoiler. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was it was it was one of those moments for me when I realised I want this. It wasn't that I wanted to make someone feel the way that he made me feel, but I wanted to feel a little less powerless for once. And so someone moves into the area where I live and basically, you know, I just decided, right, you know, I'm going to make you feel, or maybe not so much, actually, I wasn't focused on what I would make her feel, I was focusing on what it made me feel. So then I took an action that, you know, is not great. I wish that if I knew her, met her, I would, you know, definitely ask for forgiveness and apologies and all those things. But what I did learn was that the form of dominating and control and shaming that form of power was not the form of power that I wanted. I'd had it done to me, I had now experimented with it, and I just knew there's gotta be another, there's gotta be another way to feel less powerless. It's so interesting when you actually start recalling your youth and those pivotal moments that have shaped mm. you. And mm. I was so, for me, the most transformative part of the book was really addressing the internalized patriarchy that I carry with mm. me, which mm. a lot of it is around body image and how I see myself physically. And that's related to my food habits and how I exercise and all of that. So that's one side, but also mm. understanding too, that I was raised by a single mum who basically taught us if there was a man in our world, everything would be better. And so I feel like I've spent a lot of time waiting for the right person to come along and rescue me. And, you know, even now when building broad radio, I'm like, where's the hero that will invest in broad radio? And like, it's all of that. That is such a part mm -hmm. of my makeup. How can we, how can we shed that from us? Oh, I think one way is to laugh about it. You know, as I share in the book, I just sent out, I just sent out a very quick text messages to friends and colleagues and just said, what does your internalized patriarchy say? And I would literally just press send and the list came in and it was very moving. And it just made me realize, my goodness, as women, there is so much we have to navigate through sometimes to even just get out of bed in the morning. But then when I called a couple of those people, you know, there were a few tears and anger of like, I cannot believe I believe this, like my value is dictated by a man. Um, if I speak, it must be to make sure that his opinion is higher than mine. Um, I must be thin. Um, a man must choose me. Uh, men will get promoted because I'm too emotional. But then when you, so you, you can see, and there's the emotion in that, but also I remember talking with one friend and we actually were then crying from tears of like, this is ridiculous, you know? It is ridiculous. I think one way, again, is for we as women is that we share it. This is what it looks like. This is my internalized patriarchy. And we do it to each other. That's the thing. When women look at other women's bodies and say it should or shouldn't be like that, that's a form of internalized patriarchy. Her body's got nothing to do with me. Um, I should just be focusing on my body. Is it healthy? Am I nourishing it in the way that works best for me? But even this conversation where women are commenting on other women's bodies, I believe it's a form of patriarchy, but then if you talk to men, they're just like, we're just happy if you're happy to be with us. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. we don't really I, care about your body. So, I, and, it yeah. is, and for me too, I look at my husband and he just doesn't have that voice. Care, yeah. He just does not give yeah. a shit about the way yeah. he looks. Yeah. God bless him. And the, the yeah. freedom that he has in his physicality, yes. I just yeah. go, wow, that's yeah. refreshing to witness and yeah. I'm going to try yeah. and get me some of that. Um, yeah, we, absolutely. We are honouring International Women's Day today and uh, the hashtag this year is break the bias. What does that mean to you, Kemi? There's a few things. I think there's the obvious, which is, you know, break the bias around gender equality and just, you know, biased practices and systems that have that occur. But I also think what we've just spoken to as well in, in terms of this internalised patriarchy, it's kind of break our internal bias we all have biases. You know, I don't trust someone that says to me, I don't have any biases. I'm like, mm -hmm. no, you do. You just haven't been willing to confront them or go deep enough. We have all picked up biases along the way. So for me, break the bias is not just the external biases. It's also the internal biases. Because once we can acknowledge them and admit them, that's the place where we start from to then shift to something else. Oh, I love it. Um, I'm going to finish with a quote from your book, Kemi. I'm always hesitant to quote themselves back to people because um, I've learned over the years sometimes when you read something in the press they didn't say it but this is from your book so yes. <laughs> I'll yes. read it and I because I love it there is nothing living that will survive if it is not being fed this includes you and the things that are important to you so beautiful it's lovely oh I love it Kemi thank you so much thanks for your work and for your books
because you've got others, I know. Um, but head out today and get power and give it to someone in honour of International Women's Day. I think this is my new practice to give a gift on International Women's Day in the way you would for Christmas, Kimmy. Perfect. I'm going to go. I'm going to do that too, Jo. That's you and I. Yeah. So, Phil, are you up for that? We're going to give a gift? Totally yeah. up for it. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Like a Chris Kringle, <laughs> but for International <laughs> Women's Day. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks, Kerry. You take care. Thank you. Lovely to speak with you both. Take care. Happy International Women's Day.